Okay, so before I begin, I just like to say I'm extremely honored to be here. And the reason I'm here today is to share with you a story that began about eight years ago on the cricket field. And it's culminated very differently from what I expected. Now, if you came up to me about two years ago and you asked me what I wanted to do with my life, I would have shot back instantaneously telling you that I wanted to be a cricketer. But the journey over the last two years has not only changed the way I perceive myself and those around me, but has drastically altered the answer to that very question. Now, as I mentioned, the journey did begin eight years ago when I walked on to the NRA grounds for the first ever cricket camp I attended. And from the moment I walked away that day, I knew that cricket was something that was going to play an extremely important role in my life. It was a sport that I loved, a sport that I enjoyed, and one that I pursued with everything I had. So as this cricketing career or this journey went along from that point in time, another one began parallelly in 2009. And it's the day that I remember with astounding clarity when I was supposed to be in my room practicing my handwriting and I'd managed to sneak off to my grandmom's room because I was the nearest TV. And hiding there, I was flipping through trying to find trying to find a cartoon to watch and I ended up on the news channel. The topic of discussion that day was the prime ministerial candidates for the 2009 general elections. And to someone who had never been exposed to governance of politics of any kind, the initial reaction was almost of shock. Because up till then, from whatever I had heard about the leaders or people holding government office, it was almost like they were just there and we had to deal with them. But all of a sudden, now I knew that these people were ones that we put into office. And this massive void of knowledge inspired me to want to know what was going on around me. So from then on, I began reading the newspapers, I began reading a couple of books, and basically was in tune with the world around me. So this journey went along, obviously on the back burner to cricket, but it was something that I enjoyed thoroughly. For me, a major turning point was when I visited Bombay as part of a model United Nations delegation. And the biggest change wasn't in committee, where we were discussing things like the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and the conflict in Korea. But for me, the biggest change occurred outside. When we were walking back from the World Trade Center where a committee was held back to the hotel one day. And in a bookstore, I ended up seeing this book. And I had heard a little bit about it. I've read, I'd read a little bit about it, but I ended up picking it up more or less on impulse. Now, when I read Wings of Fire by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, I was exposed to the story of a man who grew up in rural Tamil Nadu in a village where no one was educated. He effectively educated himself, went on to become a rocket scientist, led India's defense program, won the Bharat Ratna, India's highest civilian award, and then went on to occupy the office of the President of India. Now the story of the man obviously by itself is extremely inspirational, but what I could relate to was the way in which the book was written. Because the most striking feature for me was the fact that Dr. Kalam could talk about everything. He spoke about politics, about economics, he spoke about sociology, there was a lot of history in the way the book was written, on failure and success, on a vision for a new India. And this wide array of knowledge was something that was extremely apparent to me and something that I wanted to cultivate for myself. So from then on, I began reading extremely passionately and on as wide array of topics as I possibly could. And these books exposed me to thoughts I would have never otherwise been exposed to and exposed me to people who I would have never known about otherwise. And now I knew about the people who had changed the course of history, who had had an impact, and I wanted to do the same. And this desire to do something, to just act, came forward in looking back what seems to be quite an impulsive move. Where I shot off an email to the guys leading India against corruption, the movement, and I told them that I wanted to be ahead of the students' movement. Now they came along extremely supportively, and I think about three years ago, Students Against Corruption as an organization was one that was founded. The organization did manage to muster up a follower base of about 650 people. But looking back, I feel Students Against Corruption, for me, was a checklist of things not to do. Because it failed on some very fundamental levels. For one, it didn't lack a connect with the people who were involved in the programs. It wasn't run effectively enough. But for me, the thing, the biggest hurdle in the path of Students Against Corruption was the fact that it couldn't have an impact on the ground. And that's what, that's what eventually killed it. Now, another reason why I feel it didn't prosper as well as it should have 
was the fact that my cricketing career was finally taking off. I had spent several hours alone in the nets working on my game and I was finally feeling good about myself on the field. I had become captain of the school cricket team. I was scoring runs and taking wickets on a regular basis. I had achieved a childhood dream of playing a game at the M. Chinnaswamy Stadium, a moment that I'll never forget. And I had broken into the KSCA First Division, playing for the Vultures Cricket Club. So I shared the field with people who were at that point in time playing for the Indian national team. So these new experiences did come my way and there's something that there's something that I do cherish. But for me, the kick was no longer there. Because part of me knew now, because my horizons had been widened, that I had been exposed to this new school of thought, that I could have had an impact off the cricket field. And a part of me wanted to explore that side, to have a change, to make an impact. There was obviously the other side that was comfortable with where I was. Comfortable with the safety of the cricket field. And something that, it basically resisted that change. And I know this logo strikes fear into the hearts of all the students over here. I'm very privileged to say that the 10 standard board exams were probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And I know I'm in a minority as far as the number of people who get to say this. But it gave me a chance, chance to step back, to take a look at things and really decide where I was headed with this. Because as everyone knows, students are made to believe that the 10 standard board exams are the most important thing they will ever do in their lives. And they almost forget how to breathe, trying to prepare for them. And I jumped on this bandwagon. I put away everything and just focused on trying to do my best. And in this period of time, a series of ideas began to come up, which I documented meticulously in my journal. And these ideas proved to be, or rather proved to, proved to play an extremely crucial role in what transpired later on. So now I had completed my exams, and it was the last day, and all of us as a class had gone out to watch a, watch a movie. And I got a call that day. A call from the secretary of the Vultures Cricket Club, Mr. Santosh Menon. And he told me that I'd been selected to go for the Royal Challengers Bangalore Youth Camp. If someone gave me the opportunity two years before when it actually came, came to me, there's no doubting that I would have grabbed it with both hands. But now at this point in time, I knew that at some level I did not want to continue playing cricket. But the decision was one that was extremely difficult to make. Because at one level, cricket was something that I associated myself with. But on another, it was something that everyone else associated me with. So to give up cricket would almost mean a loss of identity. And a part of me was scared to make that decision. So now the details had to be sent, the forms had to be sent into the Karnataka State Cricket Association. And one day before the deadline, I remember making a call to Mr. Santosh Menon. And I told him that I did not want to continue on the cricket field and to send someone else from the Vultures Cricket Club because I knew how much the opportunity meant to the people I was playing with. And his initial reaction was of shock. He couldn't believe that someone had given up the chance to play in the Royal Challengers Bangalore Youth Camp and he obviously wanted to know why. Now, I told him that it was a little more complicated and I wanted to go and meet him in person. And two days later, I walked into the residence of Mr. Santosh Menon. Honestly, not knowing much about the future. All I carried with me was a video. A video that I had condensed from the thoughts that I had documented over the, the time of the board exams. And one that eventually led to the foundation of the India Forward Trust. And it's a video that I'd like you guys to take a look at.
So as I had mentioned when I went into the meeting, I was sure of very little. I knew that it was a different direction in which I was headed. And I knew that I was giving up one that I had already was in the process of pursuing. And I expected at some level to start off India Forward as a small organization and build things as time went on. But Mr. Santosh Menon looked at me after watching this video and he said that he was ready to help in any way that he could. And all of a sudden I had access to resources that I would have never otherwise had. I spent an extremely large amount of time flipping through the trust deeds of various other registered organizations, stitching together the clauses that would eventually make the India Forward Trust one that was registered. I spent lots of time with an extremely dedicated set of individuals getting our website up in time. And all this back-end work did go on. But there was one fundamental question that I was struggling to answer. And that was, what is the India Forward Trust going to do? I've always believed that to take this call, it was important for me to step back. Take a look at both India and the world, and then see what was probably the best way to move forward. And being an eternal optimist, I genuinely believe that it's best that we take a look at the stuff that we should be proud of first. We're amongst the fastest growing economies in the world. We belong to an elite pool of nations that has our own radar imaging satellite in space and our own moon mission with the onset of Chandrayaan-1. The number of companies listed on the Bombay Stock Exchange at 6,000 is second only to the New York Stock Exchange. And half of the world's outsourced IT services come from India, amounting to a $47 billion industry. Now, if someone was to take a look at this slide alone, you'd probably get the impression that India is at par or ahead of any other nation on the planet. But there's a side to our country that isn't as prosperous. 37% of the total Indian population falls below the international poverty line. We currently have the largest illiterate population of any nation on the planet. 128 million Indians lack safe drinking water. 839 have no sanitation services. And 42% of the world's poor live in India. Now I've constantly maintained that to have change on a scale as massive as this, that political change is the best way forward. But obviously being a 16 or 15 year old at that point in time, it wasn't an option I could actively take up. And I was determined not to let this be a hurdle in my path. I was actively involved in discussions about politics and governance by that point in time. And I realized that the so-called dinner table discussions that every family has based on how the country must be run were never translated into on the ground election results. There were a couple of statements that I had heard again and again that the future of the nation lies in the hands of the youth. 11% of the members of the Lok Sabha were below the age of 40. I would heard that our leaders must be honest and trustworthy. 150 members of parliament had criminal cases pending against them. And this made me reanalyze the concept of Indian democracy. Now there's no doubting being the world's largest democracy is something that we need to take a great deal of pride in. But we also need to recognize that democracy is a form of governance that gives absolute power to the people. And India was home to the world's largest illiterate population. Now I've maintained, apart from a couple of exceptions, that the standard of leader that comes out of a democratic system is going to be directly proportional to the standard of life that the average citizen leads. And this is what strengthened my belief in education as a weapon for change. Because there are obviously various social problems that you can deal with, with education. But I also felt if India Forward as an organization could support 15 children with their education right till the end, two or three general elections down the line, we would have 15 more families of conscious voters who knew what they were doing. So after I had these ideas, my average bedtime had become 3.15 a.m., which obviously had my parents quite worried. 300% was the increase in my telephone bill, which I did have to face a little bit of stiff talk from the parents. But it all seemed worth it when India Forward was launched. On the 12th of August 2012, in a function attended by Mr. Rahul Dravid. And when I was there talking to the media about this idea I had, I thought of something. And I think to express this idea to you, it's best to be play a little game. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up two words on the screen. And you guys need to tell me what's the first name, the first thing, basically what pops into your mind when you see those two words. Exactly. It's the same for me. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. 
Now, there's no doubting that Gandhi is symbolic of the salt march. But according to me, it's important to recognize that the salt march would not have been symbolic if it weren't for the 100,000 people that were behind Gandhi. And this is the same for a leader at every single level. In Gandhi's case, they were physically behind him. But the only reason that leaders are there is because of the people behind them. And I, this reiterated my belief in education as a weapon for change. Because we could make the people aware that the politicians, that the leaders were dependent on them. And that it wasn't the other way around. And according to me, this is the first, first stage in achieving change on a larger scale. This thought also drew an uncanny parallel to myself. Because I had come in only with the idea of India forward. But it was the people who put in the hard work, who didn't get the credit that they deserved, who made the organization actually exist. And I think it's extremely important that they get their due. There was obviously Mr. Santosh Menon, who played an extremely significant role in making sure that the organization went forward and was registered. There was Godwin, who was extremely dedicated in making sure our website got up in time. There was Rajat Nair, who supported me at a time where I least expected it. And there was the India Forward team, which eventually, as of now, is running the organization, is making sure that day-to-day -day activities go as they should. An extremely dedicated set of individuals that I'm extremely honored to be working with. Now, India Forward as an organization as we stand today is looking at sending 160 children to school in the next two months. 70 of whom suffer from cancer. We're looking at renovating three government schools totally by the end of Jan. We're looking at, or rather already established, a collaboration with an American NGO and are looking at setting up collaborations with local NGOs to develop water purification technology. And we also aim at widening our range by getting various other schools to run similar programs. Now, India Forward as it is, is something that's come a long way from when it actually started. But I feel the only reason I'm actually standing in front of you here today was my ability to defy logic at the one moment where it mattered the most. The moment where I picked up the phone and told Mr. Santosh Menon that I was no longer going to continue on the cricket field. At that point in time, the most linear, the most logical thing to do would have probably been to continue on the cricket field. Because I was scoring runs, I was enjoying the game, and I felt I could have made a career out of it. And that's what my mind was telling me. But my heart wanted to do something else. And I feel, looking back, that at some level I would have failed as a cricketer. Because at some level I did not want to be on the cricket field. And that would have come to the fore at some point in time. Now the one thought that I would like to leave you guys with today, if there was just one thing that you could take away from this talk, is that irrespective of what you want to do, there will be people who are going to tell you that you're not good enough, that you're not old enough, that you don't have the experience, that you don't know how things really work. And they'll rattle off a list of thousands of things that are going to hinder your progress. But the only thing that stands between each and every person in this room and greatness is action. Because when you get the job done, all arguments are rendered invalid. And more importantly, you feel the drive to soldier on and do more. Now before I leave the stage, there's a quote that I want to share with you that moved me greatly. Albert Einstein famously said that only the people crazy enough to believe that they can change the world are the ones who eventually do. So as we leave TEDxMAIS today, I urge each and every one of you, at whatever level, at whatever scale, to be the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you.